Welcome to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, your ticket to all things college football. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? Join us as we talk college football from the national championship to college rivalries to bowl games to the Heisman Trophy to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Hello and welcome to the GSMC College Football Podcast hosted by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am their host, Ethan Orfe, and uh hope everybody has had a wonderful new year. Start to the new year as as this comes out, we'll be a few days into 2020. Uh I hope everybody's gonna look to be positive into this 2020, move on with some some good vibes, some good, some good ideals, some good goals. If you have some, uh, some goals you set up, some New Year's resolutions that you want to do. Uh, I hope all those things turn out to be good for you and all those who are listening to the GSMC podcast network. My New Year's, uh, was pretty good. I went to the botanical gardens in, uh, Atlanta with, uh, my girlfriend. So that was fun. And, uh, I've been catching up on some, uh, some college football, I've been watching some pro football, I've been uh, trying to consume as much football content as I can, because as you know, uh, football is coming to an end very soon, and uh, it's going to be a sad time for us football fans, but we shall prevail. So, the first thing I want to start off today with is just some bowl games, some looking back, and some just some general thoughts I've had on uh, a few of them, some of the bigger ones, so... uh Let's talk Georgia Baylor. Uh, you know, Georgia came out on top 26 to 14, and I found it an uh, interesting one just because of a lot of people think that teams that have a lot of potential NFL draft um, draft players, people who are preparing for the draft, people who declare, usually their bowl teams are not as competitive as they were during the regular season. For obvious reasons, both people who are going into the draft usually sit out the bowl games to prepare and to not risk any further injury. And that typically means that that team will suffer as far as depth is concerned and a lot of more younger players will be playing. And I found it interesting because Georgia's team had a couple upper uh, underclassmen that really showed up and showed out on the defensive side of the football. And... Georgia really came to play. They had a good game plan going. And it wasn't like Baylor went and laid and laid an egg. They definitely were competitive, especially in the second half. In the second half, Baylor was starting to to figure some things out and move the football and uh make a game out of this and uh Georgia uh show why they were one of the top teams in the country coming into this season and leaving out of this season, they still were in uh high contention, even though they did not make the college football playoff uh that's just a little note i just enjoy the fact that bowl games still matter to people and maybe it's more of a underclassman thing maybe it's a way for underclassmen to make a name for themselves instead of in my opinion being a good showcase for upperclassmen who want to take a shot at the draft but may not have the has not maybe have been have overlooked due to the more higher profile teams in the country taking a lot of the spotlight away from some of these smaller teams and uh, players that may have potential but are just not getting all the looks. So it was just an interesting contrast from seeing what I think is would be good for some players and uh, letting the letting the next man up get some spotlight. That was really fun to watch. Uh, next team would be Oregon Wisconsin versus Wisconsin in the Rose Bowl. And you know, if uh, anybody knows college football, the Rose Bowl is the granddaddy of them all. And on that day, it was just really interesting to see 
what senior quarterback Justin Herbert was going to be about. And it was a weird day for Justin Herbert as they he was not uh, passing the ball a lot. He did get in the end zone, I believe, three times. He scored three times, but he was running the ball a lot and using his legs more than uh, he wasn't really impressive throwing the ball as much as I would like to see from somebody who was going into the NFL draft and being one of the uh, top five quarterbacks in the NFL draft projection list and the top list, uh, big boards and such. So I was interested to see just what Herbert would really have to offer and what type of playmaking ability he'd be able to show in a game like this, considering that most people of his stature would have not played. And I just think that it was uh, it was a weird game for him, to be honest. Not to mention just a, just a bad game from Wisconsin in general. Now, Wisconsin, uh, they tend to win the game when they don't turn the ball over, like most football teams, but they really, really are good at winning games when they don't turn the football over. They are very much a control the pace, control the clock, control momentum team, and they turn the ball over four times. Now, you really can't win games in the National Football League, the Collegiate Football League, high school football league. You can't turnovers are drive killers and game losers. So when you do it four times, it's really tough to say that uh, you deserve to be in the game as much as Wisconsin did. But Wisconsin held Oregon to 204 yards of total offense. And it had the ball for 38 minutes on offense. So you really can't expect much but turnovers have to cost this game there should be no reason why uh Oregon just was able to win this game like this and Wisconsin had so much possession was shutting them down for most part it was just a weird game to watch and quite frankly it was just an interesting Rose Bowl from different perspectives of all across the board uh, the last game I'd like to just quickly touch on was Alabama, Michigan. Just on the, just on the idea of that Michigan was up at a certain point in this game and a lot of people were surprised and Michigan looked like they really wanted to play and they wanted to prove something, but, uh, there was just some mistakes made in the second half and Alabama just, Alabama's been there in big games before and they know how to finish games. And I don't really know what this means for Jim Harbaugh's sake as uh, I've been on record saying that I don't like to see coaches somehow get booted out because of a, they have good records, but they can't get it all the way to the promised land in college football because it's just really tough. And uh, parity within college football talent and recruiting, it can just be really hard to bring home a really, really talented group of people. And to be honest, Michigan this year was just not as talented as the next tier up as far as college football teams. And you could see it here against Alabama, who in their own right was uh, one of the better half of football teams in the in the AP polls and such for many of the year. They were top five for most of the year until they play LSU. And before they lost uh, Tua as well. So they weren't at full strength of their at their own right. And they still found a way to get it done. And that's just through... Nick Saban being a better coach and them having better recruit, uh, just more star power across the board. And it kind of just showed on display. A lot of SC teams came out with the, came out with W's this weekend in their respective bowl games. And that's just, uh, you know, recruiting is power in the SEC. If you can recruit well, you can win a lot of games. And the thing about Michigan is being in the same, sort of geographical region as Ohio State and uh, other big, big schools in the Northeast, you kind of can lose uh, a lot of talent to the bigger schools. And thus, you're really trying to find guys that fit you, fit in your system, but may not be superstar, superstar athletes. Like even Michigan State can get some uh, really, really good defensive players, but they've struggled uh, for many years getting like those offensive studs uh, for a long time and they always end up going to some of the bigger teams in the conferences and such. So it's just something to look at and something to monitor for next season and seasons prior is just uh, how recruiting is so impactful into 
these sort of situations where teams are losing their biggest players due to the draft and uh, they have to put in underclassmen and people who are the next man up and these next man up were not just scrubs either. They were sitting five star, four stars and they're waiting their time. And now they, now they have a chance to showcase why they were there in the first place. So coming up, we're going to talk a little bit more about Alabama as far as their star quarterbacks decision coming up on Tuesday with Nick Saban. That's coming up. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. All right, welcome back to the GSMC College Football Podcast, where last time we talked a bit about bowl games galore, some some big-time, big national bowl games that were played, and just some of the things that I saw that were pretty interesting, and some good talking points that have been made just around the general college football talking circles and such. So now we're going to talk about Tua's decision, a uh, highly, uh, highly rated quarterback coming out of Alabama, well, supposedly supposed to have come out of Alabama, but now he does not know if he is going to enter the NFL draft this coming year. And he is making his decision on Tuesday whether or not he's going to remain the Alabama starting quarterback for the next upcoming college football season, or is he going to enter the draft? And he'll be doing that with Nick Saban, like I said, on Tuesday during a press conference that I'm sure everybody will be keying in to look at so it's uh it's getting down to that wire of choice and Tua has the attitude of a guy who wants to always right the ship and always wants to make good on promises those type of guys those loyalty guys uh honorable guys he he is that type of prototype football player and I guess man uh, person raised in the world. And even though I think that's honorable and that's really nice, I just don't see this going in a way to where he comes back to Alabama. And I think most people don't think he's going to stay at Alabama who have seen this card pull before, has seen different things like this in the past. It's just kind of too hard to pass up the opportunity. You never really know What's going to happen to your draft stock? You don't know if you'll get hurt again. There's just so many uh, things that can happen on the football field in a whole season that you just don't know. It could be very possible that you'll never be this highly rated ever again, so to speak. So coming to play college football again, risking injury, risking your draft position to to potential uh, falling and dropping to a place that would not be financially beneficial for you or situationally. You just never really know. And you have to kind of play your cards or play the hand that you were dealt. And I think he's been dealt a pretty good hand when it comes to NFL draft coming this year, as he is probably the second quarterback off the board. Uh, There's no way that he goes above the guy coming out of LSU. And that's not saying a lot. Just because that kind of came out of surprise. No one really thought that Joe Burrow would be this good, especially after coming off a mediocre season last year. So really, Tua was the number one rated quarterback coming into the draft uh, this season. And without injury, he still probably is the most like the number one. Uh, multiple, multiple people have stated that without injury, Tua is still the best quarterback in this draft class. And... 
he still might be the best quarterback to come out when it's all said and done, when they both are in the NFL being Joe Burrow and Tua. So what does that really mean for his decision? Uh, I think he just should take, take the, take the trip, go to the combine, get himself healthy if he can and go into the draft, man. What more do you have to prove to Alabama? You won a national title. You have led the team to X amount of comeback wins. You've came in, won big games, proved a lot, made all the throws, made all the runs, uh, poise, precision, all that. Uh, Alabama is one of the best college football programs in the nation, so there's always pressure. What more are people in Alabama really going to talk about besides maybe Auburn or Auburn, I suppose? But outside of that is Alabama football. You are what they talk about from fall to December to sometimes January if you make it there. That is what Alabama people, people down south, there's Alabama fans everywhere from all over the southeastern part of the region of the United States. Alabama fans are all over the place. And they're locked in. So they have high expectations. They expect greatness. Nick Saban expects greatness. And you deliver it on all of those buttons and all of those uh, check marks. You came in during the second half of a national title game and delivered the victory. No one really thought the game was over for most people. That Georgia game, most people thought the game was over. And you did this coming in with a season still left to play, a few seasons still left to play. So people had high expectations and you approved yourself. And you went up against some tough Clemson teams. And, you know, not every victory can be made, but at the very most you played hard and you showed your worth as a quarterback and you got this far. I just don't think that you have or he has much more to prove. And that's really my opinion on it. I don't even think Nick Saban would want this, to be honest. I don't think Nick Saban's ever been a person to where he wants somebody to stay when he knows that it's time to go. Because Nick Saban is a next man up type of type of coach. He's always looking at, he always has people stocked up, ready to go uh, on the bench, learning, watching, uh, waiting their time so that way they get the shine and they can get their draft stock up and really be a good product on the Alabama football field. And he doesn't really keep people over, you know, keep people past their their point of eligibility or just point of where their draft stock can't really go any higher. He doesn't like risking his players for uh, injury. That's why I know when Tua ended up not sitting out in that game at a certain point and he injured himself, Nick Saban just looked sick to his stomach because he knew that he didn't need him in there for that long. And the worst possible thing could happen, happened. And he can't change that, but I just have a hard time thinking that Nick Saban is going to encourage him to sit out or not sit out, excuse me, but uh, to come back. He was probably telling him to make the decision that's best for him because that's what most people uh, try to tend to give advice on. You know, you're, you're your own man, you're your own person. You got to make the decision which is going to make you happy and what's best for you. So, and all we can do is just uh, accept that and, you know, judge accordingly for when he's on the field because can't judge him as a person. He's a really great human being from all accounts that I've seen. So really, until he straps up in an NFL uniform or in a college uniform, you really have nothing to say but positive things about Tua. And that's really all I'm going to leave it on because at the end of the day, you really just don't know. It'll be right after the college football playoff. So you never really know exactly how how impactful this is going to have on his decision on after this game. But most people don't make decisions after this game. He probably already has his mind made up and he's just trying to get control over the situation. He doesn't want to do the whole social media release uh, decision-making process. But if I were to be a betting man, and I'm sure there's people making bets on whether or not he would stay or he goes to the draft, I would say that he will enter the 2020 draft and it's going to be an exciting one. 
So, uh, coming up after this break, we're going to get into Mississippi State because they fired their head coach after the bowl game and what this really means about the state of college football and the idea of winning or nothing and how much time can you really give a coach to develop a program. That's coming up right after this break. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back as last time we are talking about Tua's decision of whether or not he is going to the NFL or going to stay another year at Alabama. And now we're going to go a little bit more into the SEC news of the week, which would conclude that Mississippi State head coach Joe Moorhead has been fired and now the Mississippi State football team is looking for their next head coach uh he was i believe 12 and 12 and 12 i believe in uh head coaching the two years and two he was 14 and 12 excuse me 14 and 12 is two years there and to be honest i'm not really sure how to take this news more than just the idea that college football has entered in a state of win now to the point to where coaches do not get a chance to develop players and develop the talent around said players to their schemes. And it's either you can get a do- get the job done today or somebody else will be brought in to get the job done today. And I don't know if that's a good place where college football needs to be as far as the coaching, as far as the coaching tree is concerned, because not everybody is allowed to do that. That's why when you see coaches that go to high profile jobs like a Ohio State or like even a Florida or just teams that somehow are able to collect high profile talent, good recruiting classes year in, year out. More often than not, they have more success when they bring in new coaches just because the talent will be there regardless. The talent was never going to be there at Mississippi State like that just because of how the how college football has really turned out to be in the last um seven, eight years where uh kids are going to school where they feel like they their their skill and talent will be best uh best displayed and best utilized for them to get a chance of getting into the draft. And that means so teams like in the Pac twelve, teams in the Big Ten, uh the SEC is not the only big name conference. And even in the ACC, uh, it's just a matter of the fact. Florida State gets a lot of really good recruits. Mississippi State is not the top dog of the SEC. They haven't been for years. Never, I uh, can't say never will be, but it's been a uh, it's been a really uphill battle for the better half of the last decade and some, just because of going up against SEC powerhouses like a Georgia, who always gets good recruits. LSU gets good recruits. Alabama gets good recruits every year. Florida gets really good recruits. And that's just to name four of them. And not to mention, you still have Ole Miss in your own state. Gets really good recruits compared to Mississippi State. So uh, getting talent, getting recruits going into your program is hard enough. And now you have to kind of settle with what you can get and make that work and really grow your program 
And it's hard to grow over two years. I don't think that's enough time. Uh, does he have the right to be fired because of the, um, his bowl game performance as a head coach? Uh, that's a different story. However, I think the tenure of coaches getting let go after not even three years of running the program, giving me a chance to grow because uh, your sophomore recruits are just now, or you're just now coming sophomores. So recruits from two years ago are were probably either red shirted last year, uh, sophomores. Nine times out of ten, they didn't have any true freshmen out there really uh, playing for big contention football games yet. They're still trying to learn their offense, learn the college game, uh, get more strength and conditioning. It's just hard to compete. And the SEC is no no slouch conference. You got to be ready to play. And you got to have people, you have to have players that are of the talent level of Alabama, LSU, Ole Miss, Texas A&M. Those are really, really tough places to win football games in and tough teams to play in general. And teams like that usually place in the top 15 every year. So Mississippi State is falling in line with a lot of coaches. So like Tennessee, for example, is one of those teams who they just won their bowl game, but has been known to roll the head coaching carousel a few times. And it's not an easy ride. It's hard to find the head coach for you or the head coach that can win for you. So that way you can figure this out. And this is my argument for Jim Harbaugh to why I think he shouldn't be getting this much heat for, or be on the hot seat as much as people in Michigan would like him to be on just because Jim Harbaugh is winning games in this conference. Uh, his record is really good outside of losing games to Ohio state. Now you can say that this 14 and 12 record by Moorhead is not good. And he has lost a second straight bowl game. So, you know, the resume speaks for itself on his, on his part. However, when looking at across the board, as far as head coaches across the collegiate space, uh, teams are not very patient with you as a head coach anymore. You have to win and they want to win, especially when they're in competitive conferences because they're tired of seeing teams dominate for so long and seeing teams uh, be competitive. And honestly, losing is just not something that sits well with fans and sits well with donors and athletic directors and this, that, and the third. So winning has always been the goal for every head coach, for everybody who plays sports. Winning is everything. But at the end of the day, you got to know that it's a journey. It's a, uh, it's a journey and not a sprint. Not everything can be done overnight. And sometimes it takes a lot more hard work to get to the top. And I don't think a lot of people notice that. So... When you see somebody like a Nick Saban who came from LSU and then came to Alabama and built that program up to what it is now, that takes some time. And I understand that he built a winning culture there, but before you can build a winning culture, you have to be able to build a culture. And that's what a lot of these lesser teams in the SEC have been struggling to do is building a, a consistent culture outside of, you know, being a run the football or someone like in Missouri who has been known to get big wide receivers in the past few years and letting those guys get out and do some big things. And same thing with uh, Ole Miss having two really stud wide receivers that came out of the draft last year. The having identity is just as big as building a culture. So when you build that identity, then you can start building uh, a culture of winning and I think having an identity starts with having a coach that knows what he wants to do and what, and having the coach have, you know, enough time to build the identity. Sometimes you just don't have enough time or the players that are recruiting are not turning out to be what they need to be. And that just tends to be the game of college football. It's not like the pros where you can, you can trade, you can, you know, get free agents, you can spend money. This is a, if they want to come there, they're going to come there. And you have to try and influence recruits to come to your program. And it's really hard. It's competitive. You're not just compared, you're not just uh, going up against the SEC in your own conference. You're going up against 
other conferences as well. So especially in Mississippi, where there's so many different schools surrounding you in the neighboring Southeast, just in other conferences alone, like the ACC and the Big Ten and this, that, and the third. So in reality, the way I feel about this is I don't think college should be going in this direction so rapidly. I understand that sometimes firings have to happen and you don't want to be a complacent program and you don't want to look complacent to your donors. But at the same time, you do have to exercise some patience and not everything can be about instant gratification of finding the head coach. Because even in NFL, uh, they're doing the same sort of coaching carousel of we'll give you two, three years. And if you can't get it done, you're out of here. And you kind of have to find the healthy balance of being you know, the, I guess, the coach that gets one year and done. And someone who's like Jason Garrett, who was there for 10 years and couldn't get the get past the division rounds and such. So at the end of the day, I think more patience just needs to be practiced. And we'll just have to keep looking to see what Mississippi State does for their head coaching search. As right now, they are on the hunt. All right. So after this break, we're going to go into the national championship game and look at what Clemson has to do to win it all against LSU. And that's coming right up. Are you looking for help for your fantasy football team? Check out the GSMC Fantasy Football Podcast. Get today's best advice on who to start, who to sit, even who you should draft. From sleeper picks to red-hot lineups, they got it all covered for you. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash fantasy-football-podcast. We'll cover traditional leagues, dynasty, PPR, even IDP leagues. When you need fantasy help, there's just one show to hit up. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow Follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. All right, welcome back. Last time we were talking about some Mississippi State coach firings now on the on the hunt for a new head coach and just how the state of college football is handling this coaching turnover uh debate and just how much time should a coach be given with a program before it's time to cut bait and uh now we're going to get into a program that speaks for itself a Dabo Sweeney led team that has had so much success over the past five years and is now back at the pinnacle of the mountain once again which is the national championship game versus LSU and what does the Clemson Tigers have to do to face the Bayou Bengal football team so when I was watching Clemson play against Ohio State I noticed a lot of things that were interesting as far as their offense is concerned and some things that their defense can do in order to try and slow down Joe Burrow and that offense to be able to do some, to do some things and maybe get the win. I think the first thing that Clemson has to, has to make account for is getting pressure on the quarterback, forcing him to make, tough throws, forcing him to make throws he's not comfortable with, getting him not adjusted in the pocket. Now, I know that's tough. Joe Burrow is ice cold in the pocket when it comes to reading the pressure, feeling the pressure, moving. His pocket mobility is really good. And you have to get him to move in a pocket to where you want somebody to put a hand on him to be able to make him uh, get a little bit loose with the football. So that way you can cause some turnovers and maybe get him into situations where he will not be himself. So that means sending up some really good pressure, stopping the run game. So everything revolves for LSU. LSU has been big on the passing game. That's been, they revolutionized the way they run offense 
since the, the Les Miles era, everything's big air, big plays in the air. Joe Burrow has been a passing uh, savant in recent time. And still, LSU does run the football a lot. And LSU predicates themselves on running running the football for when teams forget and they give up, they get gashed and they give up some big yardage. And they have this effect to where once they get both things going, it's really just almost impossible to stop them from scoring the football. So you have to take something away. And it's just really hard to take away the passing game in college football when the run game is going. So taking the run game away is the first step to being able to stop this LSU offense or at least slow it down. Because at the end of the day, LSU's offense is so dynamic and every everybody's offense is super dynamic and it's hard to stop people from scoring the points on the board. So you have to think about it like this. Can you make a big play? Can you make a turnover? Can you make something happen? Can you make Joe Burrow make a mistake? And that's just kind of where college football has become. Can you make somebody make a mistake and make them pay and score on the other end? Because it's just so hard to be... Uh, dominant on statistical end of defense because offenses are just so strong. So stopping the run game allows you to force them into passing situations and long passing situations. Thus you can let loose the pass rush and see if you can get a hand on Joe Burrow and get him down to the ground or even better, get him into a interception situation where he tries to force something down the field and you have people waiting, have some safeties waiting people in double coverage that can tend to happen but that's easier said than done because it's been hard and no one has been able to do it successfully this season against LSU even at Alabama during that big game LSU had some really really strong drives where there was pressure getting to Joe Burrow but Joe Burrow just stands in the pocket and makes throws and he just has no fear in there so you have to make him fear the pass rush you have to make him uncomfortable and that's going to be a big challenge for that defense offensively Clemson has to be able to control the tempo of the game and not let LSU's defense get hot early now LSU's defense has a tendency to come out really strong in the beginning and near the end they kind of let loose off the gas because usually they're up by 20 points or something like that, especially against teams that are not on par with them. They can really get the score up and they don't typically finish games as strong as they should defensively. But if you let them get out on you early and maybe make you make a mistake, it's really hard to come back on LSU because they are really talented across the board in the defensive backfield and in the linebacker spot. And they may not be the best shutdown defense and not the defense we are used to seeing on the LSU branded football team. They are still capable of making plays, especially early on in the games where people, they hear people keep saying that LSU's defense is not that good. They uh, give up too many points. Uh, they can be scored on and they take that, put that chip on their shoulders and then they come up with a few big stops in first and the second quarter and they they already know what Joe Burrow can do and is capable of on the other side of the field and what uh, Justin Jefferson is able to do in the passing game and what their running back is able to do. They know their offense can put up points, so they're just playing loose and playing free for the most part and they're baiting you to make big time mistakes and you know, they're putting the ball in your hands as far as the offense to see if you can beat them and that's not the way you want to play in the L you don't want to play into LSU's hand as far as the defense is concerned you want to dictate the tempo you want to run the ball you want to use your strengths so what is your your big strength you have a really really good running quarterback and you have really good wide receivers one that uh is going to be an amazing, an amazing, amazing stud on the next level. And you just have to be able to control pace and make sure that you play your brand of the game. 
And that's just really all that it boils down to playing your brand of football and dictating your, your identity on the game makes so much of college football, big game scenarios. Every game that I've watched where a team look like their, their imprint is on a game. That's because they dictated the tempo from start to finish. That means from front seven to front seven or front seven to the guys in the trenches fighting, pushing the line, getting penetration on defense and offensively getting a push up front and being able to move the football down the field and keep people from touching your quarterback and being able to keep getting positive yardage. Everything is one at that line of scrimmage, and that is where the tempo is set. So offensively, their offensive line needs to set the tempo. Defensively, their defensive front seven has to set the tempo, and that's where that game is going to be played and how it's going to look from that point on. So just to review, defensively, Clemson probably just needs to make sure they stop the run early and often and get Joe Burrow into some uncomfortable passing situations with some long third downs, some long second downs, and not let him get out there and start making plays because that's what he is so fond of is getting out, uh, moving in the pocket, moving out of the pocket, stepping into some big throws because his eyes always stay downfield. So getting him uncomfortable is your number one priority as a defense. And offensively, just play your game and don't play into LSU's defensive hands. Take them seriously and know that eventually they will give up give up some points. So coming up after this break, we're going to talk about what LSU has to do on their side of the football to be able to win against Clemson, and that's coming right up. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. SMCpodcast.com for more info. All right, welcome back. So last time we talked about Clemson's keys to winning the national title. And now we're going to get into LSU's keys to winning the national title game and bringing home a title that LSU has not had since 2007. So, of course, offensively, the key for LSU to win is to keep Joe Burrow as clean in the pocket as possible and let him do what he does best which is reading the game. Uh, he makes really great reads. He knows how to make all of his reads in the pocket. And when the pocket breaks down, he's so good at moving in and out of the pocket and making throws and creating plays. He is just really good at doing that. So keeping him clean will bring you the best result as far as that. But in, in all aspects, uh, they just need to play their brand of football, just like, Clemson needs to play play their brand of football as well. LSU has had the most dynamic offense in college football uh, in quite some time. Uh, It their passing game has been incredible to watch, and just the transition from the Les Miles era to the Ed Orgeron era has just been just been phenomenal. Uh, They've become a real modern offense. Uh, every sense of the word and they still run the football effectively too so it's not like they've uh they've slowed down in the running game department they just now have a different element to them and have a a game that really really shines in college football 
and has made Joe Burrow shine as a Heisman Trophy winner and is going to make him shine as a quarterback in the future, probably to the Cincinnati Bengals if things all line up to how they should in the NFL draft. Now, Joe Burrow is a guy who is able to break down a defense better than most players can in college football. And really, I've never seen it in a guy this good as far as a passer at the highest stage. And, like, he's not somebody who has been playing in uh, in smaller conferences, kind of getting overlooked and having to still having good statistical seasons. He is a guy doing it on the biggest stage and the biggest moments. And his intangibles are something that you just can't find. Like, you know how people say speed kills and you can't buy speed? Well, you can't. You also can't buy intangibles and you can't. You just don't. You have to just get guys who have it in them. And he has the it factor that no one really has else in college football right now. And that's saying a lot because there's so many. There's a lot of good, talented players coming into this 2020 draft. And Joe Burrow might be the best of them all when it comes to having a certain level of it to his game. So letting him do what he does best is going to be the best solution for LSU going forward uh, to win this game. Uh, Really more so they need to be worried more on the defensive side of the ball because of what people like Trevor Lawrence like to do. He likes to get into the run game and he likes to mix it up with the option and that can be something that team that the LSU defense needs to be very aware of and not bite all the time. So what do I mean by that? Uh, sometimes you want to play the quarterback and sometimes you want to play the running back and you don't always want to get, you always don't want to assume that the running back is going to get the ball on the handoff. Cause we've seen in the semis that when he gets a crease, Trevor Lawrence can go and he has the speed and the takeoff ability to go get a large one. And he's not afraid of the moment because he's been there before. And he knows what it takes to get the job done at the end of the day. And so does Dabo Sweeney. So the defense has to play their best football of the season. So like last segment, I said LSU's defense uh, has been a bit underlooked as a a uh, as a top quality defense, just because of the amount of points and yardage they give up during the end of games. And they it all culminates into their stats and it makes them look worse than what they might actually be, which is a, a serviceful defense. They're not the best, but they're not certainly not the worst and they can make plays and their defense is going to need to be making plays against Trevor Lawrence in this offense in order to secure the victory that, I think is going to be in their favor. Uh, they just need to play inside themselves and not not lose sight of what the goal is. The goal is to get stops and to give the ball to their offense to seal the deal. They don't need to play super outside of their their own realm and abilities. We all know that they have some studs in the defensive back category, but we also know that Clemson has some really stud wide receivers. So those matchups are going to be really interesting to look at especially from their All-American safety, uh, LSU's. He is going to have to have a big game to keep uh, Clemson's wide receiver court under wraps and not let out the big play because at the end of the day, Clemson had a lot of big plays in against Ohio State that ended up turning the tide uh, for their favor. So not preventing big plays is something that LSU has struggled with on the defensive end sometimes, and that can get them in trouble, as you've seen in a couple games uh, this season where, like in Texas or Alabama, they give up some big plays that can keep teams in games that they really aren't supposed to be in, and you don't want to give any more firepower to someone like a Trevor Lawrence and a Dabo Sweeney-led offense. So I really do think that LSU has the best chance to win this game just because of the sheer firepower that they have on offense and that their defense isn't as bad as people say uh, say it can be. So their offense is literally the best in college football. And if we saw what Ohio State was able to do against Clemson's defense, who Clemson's defense is no scrub. They're really good, uh, one of the best in college football. 
and Ohio State was able to move the ball pretty well down the field, and they had control of the game for the most part throughout that game until some big, uh, some big time calls happened. Uh, you're gonna have to just wait and see what happens on Monday night. But to be honest, I just don't think their defense can handle what LSU is able to throw at them from a play calling standpoint, from a personnel standpoint. Uh, their wide receiver group is just about as good as anybody in college football, maybe besides Alabama's. And Alabama has uh, three people deep on their wide receiver core that could be Sunday t- type players, which means they're going to be uh, NFL type wide receivers someday. So, uh, seeing LSU being able to maneuver the football down the field just so effortlessly throughout the season, uh, all statistical evidence shows that they are as good as they say, as good as they show and as good as their record says they are. And I'm going to be taking LSU in this game just because of just the sheer dominance of the fact that Joe Burrow and the offense can get the job done no matter what that defense does because they've been put in tough spots before and they've been able to perform and they've played big games and were able to perform and I don't think Joe Burrow ever lets the moment get to him. He always seems bigger than the moment, personally. Uh, even when they won against uh, Oklahoma, he just said that's what they were supposed to do. And he didn't look excited. He didn't look uh, mad. He didn't, he didn't really have a, a lot of expression when he won that game because he takes after Ed Orgeron, who... Uh, has a has made an identity, like I was stating earlier in the podcast. Identity is super important. Ed Orgeron's identity is doing your job and doing what you're supposed to do so that way you can move on and improve on what you need to get better at. But at the end of the day, doing your job and helping your man, helping your net fellow man do their job is something he is really, really big on. And Joe Burrow has done plenty, uh, if not more than enough, of his job as the quarterback of LSU. And it's going to be a really fun game to watch. I hope it's a good game. I hope it's not a blowout. Uh, It's going to be an interesting coaching battle between Dabo and Ed Orgeron, and I'm just interested to see how that is going to turn out. All right, so we're going to go into another quick break, but after coming back, we're going to talk about a little... Uh, college football video game stuff so you know that rule that uh, players can make money off of their likeness is coming back into consideration so I just wanted to have a little fun and talk about uh, some players who I think could be the cover athletes of some college football video game so that'll be coming up right after this This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. All right, so uh, last segment we talked about some keys that LSU needed to do in order to win the national title game. And now, just because I feel a little bit sad that college football is coming to an end for the season, uh, i like to talk about how I used to cope with uh, games like this and times like this when sports, uh, sports would come out of season. And I still crave the need to watch them and talk about them. I would play uh, sports video games. So a uh, big NBA 2K player, Madden, NCAA uh, football when it used to be around. And that was one of my favorite games ever to to really play because you, you could do it endlessly. There used to have a mode called uh, Dynasty Mode where you would pick a program and you would try to make them kind of basically like the Alabama of this generation. You would raise them up, especially if you uh, like uh, 
taking smaller programs or programs that had, uh, you know, need to be brought from the ashes and returned back to their graceful promised lands of once they used to be. And you would do the whole nine yards, the recruiting, the, the game planning, the who is coming in and who like, you know, transfers, who's coming in and out of the season. Even uh, players go into the draft a year before than you expect to. Uh, sometimes they come back. It was just a lot of fun and a lot of replay value in those games. So like the last one was NCAA 14, uh, which uh, I believe featured Denard Robinson. Uh, I believe so. But uh, there are just some really fond memories in those games. And it's very possible that those games could return due to the new ruling of the NCAA allowing players to make uh, make earnings off of their likeness and using their likeness to make a profit, uh, at least in California for right now. Now it's being, uh, it still hasn't been ruled a nationwide rule, if, if I am correct. Um, so just to have a little fun, just uh, theoretical, if it were to be able to be made a game again, who would be the cover of college football NCAA 2020? Uh, of course, obvious answers around would probably be the Heisman winners or the Heisman finalists. So a Joe Burrow, a um, Trevor Lawrence, a Jalen Hurts. Uh, there's a lot of a uh, lot of big time offensive players that uh, could take the list. Maybe a uh, Jeffrey Judy. He might be somebody interesting to look at. But for me, I always thought that the culmination of college football was just so. It's just such an interesting, interesting subgenre of entertainment. So of course, there's sports, and then there's the specific sports that. Uh, that you choose to follow in college football being a a kind of like an underling of the NFL in a sort of they provide the NFL with talent. Uh, it's just, there's something special about college football because for many years it was so different than the NFL. Now the NFL is kind of molding into the, the college game, which is why a lot of these younger quarterbacks uh, have had an easier transition into going into the NFL game just because they're not running as drastically different pro style offenses as than what they did in college. And I think that's a very interesting uh, take for another day. But back in the day when uh, like a few years ago, even colleges ran totally different offenses and it was just a different type of game. So when you were to play the NCAA football games, it would feel totally different than Madden. There'd be different uh, ways players move around the field, uh, different types of routes, different types of play calling, more option stuff. So, like, before the triple option became a really big thing in something like Madden, I believe the triple option didn't come into Madden until, I believe, the thir Madden 13. So, in 2012, since they release uh, the year comes out a year early. So... Uh, in 2012, uh, Madden 13 came out, and that was the year that um, Robert Griffin III came into the NFL, and he was very much known for running that triple option, being able to run the read option, and the Redskins were doing that nonstop in that first season, and then you have more teams starting to run read option type looks in the NFL and thus has kind of bled over into the, the Madden series and into the NFL in general. But that was typically an NCAA, uh, a college football thing. And, uh, and college football is really about who uh, putting the best athletes in the, the best situation to win. And sometimes your quarterback is your best athlete, and he can do it within the air and uh, with his legs. So... Running the football with your quarterback was just something super unique to college football that you really didn't see as much in the NFL, especially when it comes to like designed runs. Like nobody was doing uh, quarterback design runs. So like plays that you saw for Trevor Lawrence, where he'd take the ball one Mississippi to Mississippi, then bolt up into 
the secondary or into the second level and then break off and make somebody miss and take off for six. You just didn't get that much in the NFL. And then same thing with uh, even uh, Jalen Hurts would do it. Um, it would just be a lot of quarterbacks. Even uh, LSU's quarterback would get down there and make a read and say, okay, I don't see anything going here, so I'm going to take it upon myself and I'm going to pick up some yardage on a design run. So it's just all over the sport of college football and it's only slowly dripping his way into the NFL year by year. And someone like Lamar Jackson, who has really revolutionized the way NFL offense can be ran and, and just what you can do when you decide to build the team around your most athletic player instead of, you know, forcing players into uh, what you think the position should be played like. So I wonder what would have happened if uh, uh, teams decided to make, uh, try to do what the Ravens have done. So like someone like a Denar Robinson from years ago or uh, Terrell Pryor from years ago, maybe if their, if their careers were reborn and brought into today, I wonder what would happen. So that's why I'm interested in the, Players like Jalen Hurts and uh, when his time is ready out of Ohio State, Justin Fields and players like him have a chance in the NFL. And it wasn't seemed like that was the case even maybe four years ago. Uh, and it's just the way the league has moved into a more athletic league, a more league, a league that uh, embraces players that bring a different skill set and make Anything that can make defenses second guess is something that offenses or offenses have been looking at for quite some time. Even someone like Taysom Hill for the Saints, who doesn't typically play quarterback most times, but he came in as a quarterback and has the skill sets of a running back, a tight end, a wide receiver. He's just a football player. So there's always a place for players to make an impact, and it doesn't always mean that they have to be a traditional pocket passer or somebody who is able to make uh, all the reads and all the big throws down the field. And that's just something that was so unique to college football. And I think a lot of people are starting to really appreciate those uh, those qualities and are implementing it in other ways. But uh, back to the, the video game aspect. Uh, I was going to say that maybe it'd be interesting to see like a, like a head coach or somebody like that on the cover. So maybe a Nick Saban or maybe a uh, an Urban Meyer or maybe even a um maybe Oklahoma's head coach can kind of be the cover just because of uh just what they've been able to do over the past couple of years. Uh it would be an interesting way to bring it back. So even Ed Orgeron like, you know, putting him on the cover just for, you know, Kind of being a refreshing, refreshing face in college football, as so many people were getting tired of the, the Urban Meyer, the Nick Saban, uh, kind of love affair. Same thing in the in the NFL with the Patriots. People are tired of the Patriots winning, and or they want to see the Patriots regime end so someone else can take over. Uh, people get tired of the same narrative, same thing in the NBA with LeBron, even a little bit with the Warriors, people are ready for change. People like people like change when they're ready for change. <laughs> so maybe uh, maybe a coach. But I'm going to leave it off at that. I'd like to thank you for listening to the GSMC College Football Podcast, hosted by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would ask you to please like, uh, leave a comment, and a nice review for us, five stars, five stars, anywhere you listen. And please like us on all social media platforms. So that would be Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I'm um, Ethan Orfe, and uh, have a good day. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast, part of the GSMC Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. 
Just type in GSMC to find all of our shows from the GSMC Podcast Network. From football to basketball, baseball to MMA, and even soccer. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's episode of the Golden State Media Concepts College Football Podcast.